The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled The Convergence of Interventional Radiologists and Oncologists in HCC, Shared Decision-Making and Care Coordination at the Center of Personalized Care Across the Disease Continuum. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash FYP860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending. Welcome to uh, the peer review session, the convergence of interventional radiologists and oncologists in HCC. Shared decision-making and care coordination at the center of personalized care across the disease continuum. Uh, my name is Riyad Salem. This is Lipka Goyal. So the goals for today, um, improve your understanding of the latest safety and efficacy evidence for systemic and local regional therapies for all stages of HCC. And I'm particularly proud to have these kinds of sessions at IR meetings or meetings where there's a lot of interventional radiologists. I think it's very important that interventional radiologists learn this information, this data that people like Dr. Goyal and others are generating that allow us to work together and improve outcomes in HCC. It's also to amplify your skills and to construct team-driven uh, treatment plans that incorporate systemic therapy options for your patients with HCC, and also to equip you with tools to address practical aspects of therapeutic delivery, including adverse events management, dosing considerations, and of course, very importantly, care coordination. So again, my name is Riyad Salem. I am Chief of Interventional Radiology and Vice Chair of Image Guided Therapy at Northwestern uh, University. It's a pleasure to be here. And so let's get started. So HCC mortality is increasing in the United States, and it's one of the top drivers of cancer death in the U.S. for both men and women. Furthermore, HCC mortality is increasing globally. Nearly a million people diagnosed in 2020 and over 800,000 patients dying from the condition in 2020. Liver cancer is ranked among the top three causes of cancer deaths in 46 countries. And the number of people diagnosed with or dying from liver cancer is expected to increase 50 plus percent from now until 2040. One of the important components of managing patients with HCC is the fact that while sometimes we hear about HCC patients migrating left to right, right to left, it's much more dynamic and really much more multimodal in terms of how patients are treated and from what treatment they migrate. So they could get some systemic therapy, back to local regional therapy, surgery, ablation, radiotherapy, and that's really how actual patients move in a multi-sort of dimensional, multimodal pattern, not just left to right or right to left. And that concept was really initiated, introduced in the BCLC algorithm, and I would tell you that the prognostic components of the BCLC are outstanding and that you really have a good idea of what patient you are talking about. One of the things that we struggle with in HCC is that somebody can't ask you something like, how are your HCC patients doing? Well, which ones? Advanced, early, intermediate, with how much disease burden, et cetera. So the BCLC really provides an outstanding uh, structure for you to really understand uh, how to categorize and classify your patients so we already know what we are talking about. And today you'll hear Lipica and I, and, and hopefully yourself, in the Q&A period, really understand what a BCLCA patient means, or a B, or a C. Right away, we know we've sort of narrowed down what that patient profile looks like. And the BCLC also provides you with sort of highest level of evidence recommendations. And now in the most recent version, also gives you sort of clinical decision-making options, where if a patient is not a good candidate for that option, they might stage migrate to something else with also very good levels of evidence. The other thing is working together. The theme I think we all recognize is we have to work together. And when we work with oncologists and hepatologists and surgeons, there are many manuscripts and many studies that show that when patients are reviewed at a tumor board and discussed in a multimodal manner, in a multidisciplinary manner, their outcomes improve. Everybody is there at the top of their game with the best level of evidence, able to really make the best decision for that patient. So working together uh, really uh, is, is best to improve overall survival. So let's talk a little bit now about integrating systemic therapies and local regional therapies and, and immunotherapies in early and intermediate stage HCC. So this is a patient, Thomas is a 65-year-old patient, and we're going to show you some cases today to really contextualize what we are talking about. 
is a 65-year-old patient presents with BCLC-B disease. Good liver function, child pew A, performance status zero, unilobar multifocal disease and without PVT. So what sorts of options are we looking at in this patient? So let's take a look at, at what we have. So when you think about rationale for combining local regional therapy and systemic therapy, well, first we know that intermediate HCC is a very heterogeneous patient population, spans from small amount of tumor burden, multifocal disease, to multifocal bilobar disease. So very variable from tumor burden and liver function perspective. We know that our ability to treat patients with local regional therapies are affected by tumor burden. Larger tumors are harder to treat than smaller tumors. There's also this concept that's emerging and we are recognizing as a field that you have to make sure that you don't miss the opportunity to have the patient optimally treated based on their liver function and their stage with all available modalities, which means you can't chemoembolize somebody over and over and over or radioembolize or ablate or do all these LRTs without considering liver function and when is the time to move to the next type of therapy. And of course, there's a lot of level one evidence on systemic therapy, so it's natural to put these two things together. So again, the idea of putting this together is maybe starting treatment a little bit earlier and, and getting, you know, optimizing uh, these therapies um, and hopefully increasing the number of patients that we can define as having exhibited a cure. Now, historically, when you think about BCLCB staging from sort of B to advanced, the local regional therapy landscape dominates from on the earlier side and the intermediate side and falls off on the advanced side. And, and in reverse, on the advanced side back to intermediate, it's really systemic therapies with little role for uh, local regional therapies. But this is now changing. With the data that we have, the studies that are being published, this is now being rethought. And I think appropriately so. And I think this is sort of really turning a lot of our initial concepts and things that we've thought historically really on its head. When you think about prognostic scores for chemoembolization, which is the worldwide gold standard for local regional therapy, there are various models and scores that people use to think about whether you continue or you initiate or you stop uh, a chemoembolization. One of them is the 6 and 12 prognostic score. And that looks at, that's looked at over 1,500 patients or so. And it looks at the linear predictor, which is the largest tumor diameter with the number of tumors. And if you're less than 6 or 6 to 12 or greater than 12, you have a decreasing overall survival. It makes sense, right? You have larger tumor burden. And the more the tumor burden, the worse the overall outcome. So really interesting data that helps us think about, well, what can I benefit with this patient? So if I have multifocal bilobar disease, I'm going to be above 12. I'm not going to benefit all that much. Should I do a little bit of LRT or no LRT or go right to systemic therapy? This is what these kinds of data sort of elicit in us when we th think about working, uh, working together with our oncology and hepatology colleagues. Now, you're going to see the slide twice today. And one of the concepts here has to do with assessing response after chemoembolization, which can be very challenging and, 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 and how patients respond to chemoembolization. We have already, we recognize, I think we've already talked about the fact that the lower the tumor burden, the better the response to LRT. That makes a lot of sense. But then sometimes assessing response can be challenging. Lipidol uptake, enhancement changes, um, having simultaneous treated and untreated uh, uh, liver lesions because we do segmental treatments and multifocal disease. It can be very challenging. What do you do with the untreated area in parallel with a, with a treated area? So it can be very challenging. And understanding this kind of response is going to bring us to the concept of taste uh, untreatability a little bit later on. Now, there have been many studies looking at combining systemic therapies uh, in the intermediate and then the chemoembolization phase, um, and mostly in the TKI uh, uh, realm. So the post-taste study, the BRISC uh, study, SPACE, Oriental, and the TASTE-2 studies all tried to combine TKIs with chemoembolization, and really no one's really been able to improve overall, sur uh, overall survival. Now, more recently, the TACTICS trial used sort of a time to untreatable or untasteable type progression. I think it quite irrelevant endpoint when you think about it, and that was able to improve that PFS, that novel PFS measure, without improving overall survival. There's a, there's a clinical benefit. You can see a difference there, but it did not reach statistical significance. So the phase two taxic, tactics, the randomized trial, was really the closest we've come um, to showing that combining uh, at least TKIs with chemoembolization makes, uh, makes an impact. Now, very excitingly, this was presented at ASCO GI this year. Now, the very first randomized trial um, with the, to meet its endpoints in this space, the Emerald One trial, a phase three trial, looking at Derva, Bev, combined with chemoembolization. Chemoembolization is the gold standard across all of the arms. I think there are some other trials that are maybe uh, changing that idea, but embolization is, is, in, uh, is the gold standard. And you're adding either Derva alone or Derva, Bev. Uh, 
And, and I think, again, this was a very well-run trial with a very relevant PFS primary endpoint. So this was, was the trial that was performed, 600 plus patients, uh, three arms of interest stratification factors. You could do DEBS or conventional TACE, um, geographic stratification factor, but also you were permitted some vascular invasion. They didn't end up getting enrolled all that much, but a relevant uh, piece of information here in this patient population. The trial really mimics how we do uh, chemoembolization and treat intermediate disease now. We try to do the embolizations, do that, and then migrate to systemic therapy. So here, sure enough, you're able to get your chemoembolization or your drug-eluting bead with Derva early on. And then the BEV in the patients that were going to get BEV didn't get started until um, week, week 16. So really, and, and that's because of legitimate concerns over vascularity, et cetera, right? So nobody got the BEV before uh, week 16. So again, a trial that really parallels how we practice. And I think these types of clinical trials that really mimic clinically how things make a lot of sense for us as interventionalists and, of course, as oncologists, I think makes a lot of sense. Very interesting that the data uh, uh, confirmed uh, that the fact that most of us do one, two, maybe three chemoembolizations, very four, very rarely a fourth one, but one to two chemoembolizations before we migrate to, to something else. And there was clearly sort of a, a component here where patients, uh, because of either progression or liver dysfunction or other factors that are hard to, to discern sometimes, you know, don't get all of the treatments. And that was at about uh, three, uh, 75% or so across all of the arms. But everybody was able to get the DERVA. So again, we start to now think about the fact that we can do a lot of systemic therapies safely, um, and, and this was one of the initial questions we had 5, 10 years ago, how safe are these combinations? If you look at the outcomes, um, there was a significant PFS benefit of derva bev taste versus taste alone, which is really sort of the primary analysis. And so adding derva and BEV really uh, almost doubled uh, PFS. And we're waiting for the overall survival outcomes, but a very respectable, uh, uh, respectable hazard ratio of 0.77. And we did not find that difference if you just did Derva taste versus taste alone. So it really shows that VEGF is playing an effect. And you can even see that if you, if you think about the BEV being started at week 16 or so, that the curves start to diverge around month, month six or so after BEV has been initiated, right? So clearly the BEV is playing an important role. Adverse events are what you might expect after uh, uh, an anti-VEGF. So um, uh, hypertension, proteinuria, uh, some varices, but nothing sort of uh, that, you know, no red flags uh, that, that would warrant these combinations being, being uh, labeled as, as unsafe. So let's, let's talk a little bit, if I can talk to Lipica a little bit about this, about Thomas, because we've been talking about sort of the level of evidence and where we are. But Thomas, as I mentioned again, is 65. He's got good liver function, good performance status, and is, uh, he has a multifocal disease and no, and no vascular invasion. And so the questions as, we, as, as they come up is, is taste alone best for this patient? Or, or have you been convinced, Lipica, about the Emerald One approach? Are you changing your practice? And what about some of those patients with, with uh, VP2? Is that, is that affecting your decision-making here? Yeah, great question. This is coming up in all of our tour boards now. When do we uh, apply Emerald One? And uh, as Riyadh said, I think it was a very well-designed study. I think the progression-free survival endpoint was a great endpoint because we can't, we should not, you know, need to wait until overall survival data to think about how the, these uh, inform our practice. But the question is: Is it going to improve overall survival, or is it just going to push out the time to progression? And is there a way to figure out which patients are going to benefit the most? And so are there some patients that we're actually going to cure by doing TACE one or two times and then giving Derva Bev um, with Derva along with TACE in the initial stages? Um, or are we just giving people the potential side effects of Derva Bev up front and then uh, you're not actually curing them, they're just recurring six months or 12 months later? And so it's definitely a conversation we have with patients, a conversation we have in our tour board. We talk about the data. It's really encouraging that these data are positive. And so it's often a conversation that I'll have with my patients and share. We can think about doing the Derva and the Derva Bev up front, or we can think about doing it later. So shared decision-making with patients. Sure. And I think we've talked about that. I think we, we, we think that that is going to improve overall survival, the shared decision-making, multidisciplinary um, discussions, et cetera. And then just very briefly about VP2 disease. And so 
this, this, this will come up. I mean, this person has multifocal disease. There could very well be some clot in there that we can't really see. Um, what do you, what do you make of the VP, VP1, VP2 inclusion in Emerald? Does that affect your decision-making at all, or, or you're still reserve, reserving these sorts of patients for a systemic therapy in general? Yeah, I think the fact that if anyone has, it's great that Emerald 1 included patients with VP1 and VP2 disease. I think about these patients with the macrovascular invasion and or bilobar involvement as the people who are at highest risk for recurrence. Um, and so these are the people that are we'll see when they we do some subgroup analyses, which are always um, you know not powered to for the primary endpoint, but to give us a sense of where we're seeing the maximum benefit. So certainly in the high-risk patients are the ones where I think about it the most. Yeah, I agree. So uh, let's continue to sort of look at what we have and what the studies are that are ongoing and what we expect to see soon. Emerald-3, uh, Durva, Tremi, anti-CTLA-4, plus a TKI, Lenvatinib, in combination with TACE and local regional therapy. Again, very good design where TACE is the gold standard uh, across all of the arms, testing a variety of combinations. So we're waiting on that uh, on that study to complete and to, to read out as well. Very exciting Um clinical trial design. So that'll be uh, interesting to see. There are some studies now that are looking at uh, systemic therapy alone in the intermediate stage. So this is the demand trial looking at tezobev with chemobilization versus a tezobev alone, right? So, so uh, just having systemic therapy in the intermediate space. So that'll be very interesting to see what that role is, because there certainly is a lot of discussion about applying uh, systemic therapy in intermediate, which part of the intermediate I think is important to think about the the, the left, middle, or the right part of the intermediate uh, cohort is important. LEAP12, we're waiting on data to, to be a report on that, a phase three trial, looking at LEN-PEM with uh, chemoembolization. So again, uh, large sample size, randomized uh, phase three, very relevant stratification factors, tumor burden, something we need to define and better highlight what tumor burden actually is, because really tumor burden, the sort of imaging findings on, on, uh, on MR or CT are really the only imaging biomarkers we have when we think about what we're gonna, how we're going to treat uh, patients. There are some interesting uh, studies that are ongoing now, sort of certainly thought-provoking uh, phase two trials looking at Y90 now with uh, Im immunotherapy. So there's the Emerald 90 trial, Emerald Y90, looking at Derva-Bev after radioembolization. So again, designs of studies where you do your LRT and then you add systemic therapy. I think that's a very comfortable uh, mechanism of action. I think a, an application of a clinical trial, I think a lot of IRs uh, uh, like that. Sometimes switching it has caused some issues in some trials, but not, not that many. And then the Rowan trial is also ongoing, Derva-Tremi after radioembolization. So Derva-Bev or Derva-Tremi, so very interesting designs. There's some phase one, two studies have been published, the SOLID trial, looking at Derva after uh, Y90 radioembolization, sort of in an uncontrolled setting. Interesting TTPs, 15 months, OS, really not reported. A lot of these are sort of safety and, uh, and, uh, and sort of concept type studies, but very interesting uh, to see that. Uh, I'm very interested in this study. This just was published a, a few months ago. Uh, PEM uh, with 90 and patients with, uh, with Y90 and patients with poor prognosis. They define that as PVT, multifocal or diffuse disease. Um, that's, that's pretty advanced patient, po that's a pretty bad patient population. Their OS was 27 months. Uh, PFS, 10 months. Um, so very thought-provoking. These are very, very high overall survivals for a patient population uh, that we would assume would be in the 15 to 18 to 20-month category with modern systemic therapies. So very interesting to see this kind of OS. I'll be interested to look at the, uh, the, the details of the baseline characteristics in that patient population. Another sort of safety analysis looking at, at NEVO and patients who got Y90 and BCLC B2, sort of an Italian subclassification, the, the Bolondi classification of B1 to B4 in intermediate disease. So they look at that patient population, response rate 40% or so. So a lot of very interesting sort of safety studies that aren't preventing us from continuing to investigate the combination, which I think is one of the most important points we've learned in the last few years. We can do these combinations and they are, they are safe. A lot of other sort of exciting studies, uh, Nipi, uh, Ipi Nevo in, uh, uh, with chemoembolization versus placebo and Derva Tremi and Cabo Nevo, et cetera. So there's a lot of interesting studies that are ongoing. I'll be excited to see how they come out. So basically sort of what I take home from all of these types of collaborations and all of these types of data that I see is clearly that rationale that we have for combining these types of therapies is evolving. It's being refined. It continues to expand. We need biomarkers, but that's important. And in the real world setting, which I think is very important, validating type data, 
uh, these data are safe. We can, there's nothing that's preventing. I'm not hearing from Lipica and my other medical oncology colleagues saying, you know, there's, there, there are some issues here. We have to be careful combining these therapies. And then this collaboration really spans across that BCLC spectrum. You know, you're going to hear Lipica talk about early and intermediate, very interesting positive uh, phase three data. But we're looking at diagnosis to biopsy to treatment and then shifting back and forth again in multiple planes uh, and then looking at, at, at response. So a lot of interesting things going on in, in collaboration. And over to Dr. Goyal. Great. Thank you, Riyadh. Uh, so Riyadh mainly talked about intermediate stage, BCLC stage B with a little bit of C thrown in there. I'm going to be talking about BCLC stage A, so early stage disease, and then I'll be talking about BCLC stage C, where we use systemic uh, therapy. So um, we have a patient here, Barbara, 58 years old, who has BCLC stage A. Uh, the tumor is about an 8-centimeter tumor. It's amenable to surgical intervention. Child PUA, performance status of zero, no cirrhosis, no portal hypertension, AFP of a greater than 5,000. So, Riyadh, how would you think about this patient? Single lesion, good liver function. What would you do as your first step, and would you consider adjuvant immunotherapy? Yeah, I mean, I think this is sort of the, some of the data that, that is emerging now. That I think you're going to talk about it in a few minutes. You know, this is potentially a resection patient, right? It's not non-cirrhotic, so the, I, the issue comes up. It's like, well... Um, Liver transplantation is limited. It's limited in geography. It's limited in numbers of, of organs that we have. We need to figure out more ways to make patients more ablatable and treatable and even resectable. And so this is sort of what I would be thinking about in a, pa in a patient like this. Great. So what do we know about the immune environment in HCC? So we know in diseases like melanoma and lung cancer, there is a strong... Uh, rationale for using immunotherapy because there's a high immune infiltrate, a lot of PD-L1, PD-1 positive tumor cells, immune cells, and they can be highly responsive to immunotherapy. The response is over 60% in melanoma. But we know in HCC, those responses tend to be on the order of 10 to 15% when you use single agent PD-1, and then they're around 20 to 30% when you use combination therapies. So there was a study done by the team at Mount Sinai with Dr. Sia's lab, and they looked at 1,000 samples, roughly, of HCC, and they found that about 25% were in this immune class, 25 to 30% were in this immune class, and they divided the tumors into active immune class versus exhausted immune class, and the active immune class had certain markers, like they had increased PD-1 and PD-L1 expression, they had increased immune cell infiltrate. They had decreased chromosomal aberrations. And overall, this activated immune class showed that potentially it has a um, higher potential for response to immunotherapy. So the big question, as Riyadh and I talk about trials, and we show that there's this population of patients that benefits, the big question for us in the clinic is, how are we able to select those patients or who are going get, to get the most benefit? Now, this was deep sequencing and deep analysis. We can't do this on every patient walking into the clinic, but it just highlights that there is the potential to do biomarker analysis in HCC the more we're able to get biopsies. And if we can predict, it'll really help our patients a lot. So hepatic resection, I'll talk about this. And Riyadh, I'll ask you a little bit about, do you think about it similarly when you're doing TACE or Y90? So who are the patients who are resection candidates? Generally speaking, single nodule, no portal hypertension. We often look for platelets greater than 100, uh, spleen smaller than 12 centimeters. We often look for a bilirubin that's well, within normal limits. Um, and then for the future liver remnant, once you do the resection, if someone has a normal liver, we look for 20% at least. For people who have fibrosis or steatosis, at least 30%. For cirrhosis, we want to be able to have at least 40% left behind. We had, when you're thinking about local regional therapies, how do you think about uh, liver remnant and some of these other yeah. So, yeah. So, so these these remnants have been published, you know, historically, um, and and they're sort of classic numbers that have been used. One of the things that we're now using is sort of using local regional therapy as a bridge prior to resection. The problem with resection is it is potentially curative, but also has a seventy percent recurrence rate. So, one of the things that I think is being embedded in this kind of patient population is: should we treat, embed a small biologic test of time, and then really isolate the patients that aren't rapidly progressing? in order to lower that 70% recurrence rate, but also really operate on those patients that are going to really benefit from, from that perspective. And so we use various techniques now, such as radiation lobectomy and others, to really hypertrophy 
uh, that side and really to embed a biologic test of time. That's kind of like this neoadjuvant LRT, give them a couple months. If you develop metastases, we didn't miss an opportunity for resection. Probably we're going to have an early recurrence anyway. So as Riyadh just mentioned, the recurrence rate is 70 80% post-resection. So the factors associated with these outcomes, there's uh, the number of nodules, the tumor size, the tumor-free margin, and blood loss. So we know that when people have multifocal tumors, tumors greater than five centimeters and close margins, they have a higher risk of recurrence. And so we all know that there's been no adjuvant systemic therapy that we can use for HCC. This study, the Serafinib study, the STORM trial, it was 1,000 patients, 28 countries. People were able to get up to four years of serafinib versus placebo. And in this study, even though people were able to get up to four years, the median amount of time people got serafinib was one year. Why? It's a really tough drug. And overall, the recurrence-free survival, which was the primary endpoint in the study, was about 8.5 months in both arms. So negative study. So for years, we haven't had an adjuvant, op uh, an adjuvant option. Along comes uh, another well-designed study, which is adjuvant atezolizumab and bevacizumab in patients with early-stage HCC with a high risk of recurrence that either underwent resection or ablation. They all had child PUA disease, and let's go over what the factors for high risk of recurrence is. So they defined high risk as tumor greater than five centimeters, having at least uh, having more than three tumors, having VP1 or VP2 disease having microvascular invasion on biopsy, or having poorly differentiated histology. So um, commend the sponsor for, having, uh, for selecting a population that was high risk, so it's a higher chance of being able to see a signal here. The patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio to getting one year of a Tezobev, which is it's a treatment that's given every three weeks, so 17 cycles, versus active surveillance. And if people um, had a recurrence, they were able to cross over to the atezobev arm. Um, and then there were some stratification factors, as you can see here. And the primary endpoint was predefined as recurrence-free survival, and it was done by central review, independent review facility. And so this was a positive study. This was like an earthquake in the field of HCC last year because it's wonderful to have this positive study. The recurrence-free survival the actual number was not met in the atezobev arm or the active surveillance arm yet, but you can see the hazard ratio was 0.72. The p-value is 0.012. And you can see at 12 months in the atezobev arm, it was 78%. In the uh, active surveillance arm, it was 65%. As with Emerald 1, as um, Riyadh presented, the question is, are we actually improving overall survival? Are we actually curing people by giving people a tezobev early? So let's look at that. Will we improve overall survival? When you look at 24 months, you see that these uh, curves come together, and it's about 50% in both arms, a little over 50% in both arms. Um, but the data are not mature yet, and so we have to really give the, time, the data time to mature to see, are these curves going to continue to separate? the treatment arm reverts back to intermediate risk. What we would like to see is sort of like this green, yellow, and red uh, curves where you continue to see separation between these, but we're still waiting to get mature data to see if they're going to separate. You know, something that we always think about as medical oncologists when we're giving adjuvant therapy is, are we harming patients when we're giving them adjuvant therapy? Because when you see a patient that had ablation or resection sitting in front of you, they're in one of three categories. One, they're completely cured, and anything you do to them, you're going to harm them, and you're not actually going to improve their chance of survival, maybe decrease it. Two, they have 10 little cancer cells floating around. You give them adjuvant therapy, and you convert them from not cured to cured. Or they have 100 cancer cells floating around. You give them adjuvant therapy, and you still cannot cure them. They still recur a little, bit while, a little while later. And now there are different things like ctDNA to figure out like which category people are in. But overall, when a patient's sitting in front of us, we don't know which of those three categories they're in. And so the question is, you know, in this study, six people died in the Atezo Bev arm, one patient died in the active surveillance arm. You know, the numbers are small, so we don't know if that's going to be something that's meaningful. But because people die and you potentially they were cured to begin with, you just have to think about, is this the right, um, are, are we doing right by patients? And so we got to wait. So overall, the first positive adjuvant study in HCC um, right now, there's a little bit of an overlap early on, so we have to see if that what bears out. We got to figure out if there's going to be if we're going to prevent recurrence in the second year, 
and we're going to see if we're going to delay early recurrences or actually cure people. Multiple phase three trials going on right now for adjuvant immunotherapy with a lot of the regimens that have been used in the BCLC stage C setting. So we're waiting for these to read out. Okay, so now moving on to thinking about BCLC stage C disease. So David, 66-year-old man, has multifocal HCC, has had taste times two, and now has disease progression. So we certainly talk about these patients on our tumor boards all the time. The patient has good liver function, good performance status, but now has progression after two tases, no macrovascular invasion. So Riyadh, how do you define in your own mind patients who are taste refractory? What are the telltale signs? And when do you think about when to do a third taste versus when to switch to systemic therapy? So I'm going to pass it over to you for the next two slides. Thank you. So I want everybody to take a look at this scan here. So this is still a relatively uncommon presentation, right? Multifocal bilobar disease. We don't see it that often. Um, this is sort of the classic example of the, the bad B that we talk about, but just something to keep in mind. But when that does happen, think about how you do an LRT in this setting. It's very, it's very complicated. And so this person really falls in the, the dark blue category that you see on the slide that I told you we'd get back to that really don't respond all that well to taste. Why? Because you really can't do uh, selective chemoembolization and do multiple treatments without sort of starting to do low bar treatments and really risking hepatic dysfunction. So I think it can be very, very challenging to completely treat everything in a patient with that kind of disease in multifocal by low bar in a setting where taste is supposed to be done in a selective manner. So there have been some guidelines that have sort of discussed the idea of taste unsuitability or taste refractoriness. One of it is based on tumor burden up to seven criteria, the number of lesions plus the size of the, of the largest lesion, et cetera, or, uh, the, the so-called the, 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 the kudo, kudos criteria. And then there's, of course, the idea that if you embolize somebody twice consecutively and you don't see any sort of response, um, or, even, or if you see progression, obviously it's, it's simpler, but you have to start seeing responses. So the idea is that two treatments, and again, I, I, I would propose to you that when you have that much disease, right lobe, left lobe, it's really difficult to follow the, the classic chemoembolization guidelines of selectivity and, and not doing low bar treatments, et cetera, for risk of hepatic decompensation. Thanks, Riyadh. And I think this really brings up the question, I see questions in the chat coming through, is it safe to combine IO and taste? And something interesting about Emerald One were, was that, um, as Riyadh showed, there were several patients who got three tases and four tases. And I believe that study uh, allowed patients who had uh, B7, isn't that right? Child pew B7. And so there was a differential between the PFS and the TTP in the different arms. And the question arose, is part of this due to liver dysfunction? And so it would be really helpful to see the subgroup analyses to see, are the patients who are doing the best, the people who had one or two tases, compared to the people who got three or four tases because maybe we're compromising liver function in some patients. And so, you know, the data as they mature will get some more information. So this is the timeline of systemic therapy approvals in HCC. That little red arrow is a 10-year span where it was barren in HCC where there were no FDA approvals. There were a lot of efforts being made during that time. You know, sometimes you need to fail and fail and fail until you stand up. So we had multiple failed phase three trials in MedOnc, but eventually in 2017, we, started, we finally hit our stride and started getting some approvals, and now we have eight or nine regimens that are approved in HCC. And you see now that a lot of the regimens that Riyadh mentioned are now being combined with TACE and Y90 are these regimens that have been proven to be efficacious in the uh, advanced stage setting, so Atezobev, uh, Dervatremi, and uh, Ipinevo. So... These are the two main positive studies that have come out in the front line. Want to just caveat that this is not a head-to-head -head comparison because if you look at the table one for these two studies and if you look at the selection criteria, they're different. So you cannot compare you know, um, them side by side as uh, exact comparisons. But of course, we work with the data that we have and we always do some comparison. So for the Atezobev study of I Am Brave, these are both randomized studies. In one study, I Am Brave 150, it was Atezobev versus Serafinib. In the other study for Himalaya, it was the stride regimen, which is Dervatremi. Compared to Serafinib, that was the primary analysis. And there was also a Dervalimab versus Serafinib analysis looking at non-inferiority. So in the Atezobev study, roughly 500 patients, the median survival was 19.2 months, median progression-free survival seven months, and the response rate was 30%. 
And does anyone remember what the response rate was with serafinib? It was 2%. So 30% was an, another earthquake in the HCC field to see a 30% ORR. Um, and I will also point out that in the phase one of a Tezobev, the response rate was over 60%. So it just goes to show that it's really important to think about phase one data versus phase three data, how many sites are being, um, how many sites are involved in looking at the study and like the eligibility criteria. Um, the median duration of response was 18 months. Then when you look at derva tremi where for that study, it's TREMI high dose times one, 300 milligrams, combined with Dervalimab, and then you only do Dervalimab alone once every four weeks. In that study, the median overall survival was 16.4 months. Um, the pre-FS was around four months. The response rate was 20%, and the duration of response was uh, 22 months. And then with Duralimab, we see the data right there on the right as well. Um, the response rate was somewhat similar. The PFS was somewhat similar, but you see the duration of response was longer with the stride regimen. And so now the question is, how do we think about overall survival data? We've always thought about it in MedUnc as median overall survival because a lot of our drugs target tumor cells directly. But the immunotherapies, they work a little bit differently than regular targeted therapy and chemotherapy. They don't directly act on tumor cells. They basically act on your immune system to be able to recognize this foreign invader and then have your immune system attack the cancer. And the idea is you're supposed to develop memory within your immune system to be able to long-term fight cancer. And so maybe the median overall survival is not, um, I mean, in these studies, the median overall survival did change. But when you're comparing different regimens, should we be also looking at landmark analyses? Should we also be looking at how are people doing it two years, three years, four years? Because when you see a patient with HCC, someone who comes in, has metastatic disease, and they're alive and doing well at four years, you know, in MedOnc, that's a home run for us. Because as you can imagine with serafinib, you know, the median survival used to be 12 months. And so as you can see in the I Am Brave 150 study, the landmark analyses they did was up to 18 months, and you see a separation in the curves there. With the Himalaya study, the team actually looked at four-year overall survival, and you see that it's 25% versus 15% with Dervatremi versus serafinib. And 25% overall survival for advanced HCC, I mean, that's like relatively unheard of, um, mostly because most of our studies were not looking out to four years. But this is classic for the CTLA-4 antibodies, where you actually see memory being developed, and you see some of these long-term survivals. And interestingly, the Himalaya team did two other analyses. One, they looked at patients who had immune-related adverse events versus not. And the people who had immune-related adverse events, they ended up doing better. A lot of the patients who didn't have immune-related adverse events, they also had a decent four-year survival. But um, when the patient comes in with terrible diarrhea, terrible hepatitis, part of it as a medical oncologist, you could say, well, patients like you do better. So it gives it, you know, helps people get through all of those toxicities. Um, and the second point is there were a lot of patients who had stable disease with the Himalaya regimen who also had a four-year survival. So as a medical oncologist, when you see someone with a partial response, you throw your arms at them and you say, hey, this is great. But actually with Himalaya, even with people with stable disease, there were a lot of long-term survivors. So that's important. Um, in terms of safety considerations, the big question with Atezobev was, are you going to see a lot more GI bleeding? Because of course, Bevacizumab is a VEGF inhibitor. But what they saw in these two arms was that the bleeding events, grade 3, grade 4, were quite similar between the Otezobev arm and the serafinib arm, about 6% in both arms. Um, in terms of the actual side effects, we saw more side effects and poorer quality of life in the serafinib group. We saw diarrhea, hand-foot syndrome, um, decreased appetite. The main side effects that we saw in the Atezobev arm were around VEGF inhibition. So you saw slightly higher rates of hypertension and proteinuria. When you move over to the right side of the slide and you look at the Himalaya study, again, it was Dervatremi is the stride regimen compared to serafinib. The top three side effects with Dervatremi were rash, itchiness, and diarrhea. With serafinib, you saw basically more than double rate of diarrhea, and you also saw a lot of hand-foot syndrome. One key difference between the Dervatremi regimen and the Atezobev regimen was the percentage of patients that required steroids for immune-related adverse events. Um, and this is relevant as we think about the Dervatremi combinations with TACE and with Y90. Uh, in the stride regimen, with the stride regimen, 20% of patients required steroids. 
with the atezobev regimen, about 13% of patients required steroids for immune-related adverse events. So there's another study that is now positive in the frontline study. So we as medical oncologists, where for 10 years all we had was serafinib, now we're debating between multiple different regimens. So this is a trial that we've been waiting for the results for a while now. We're very excited to see them. This is the phase three Checkmate 90W study, and it was the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab, which is already currently approved for HCC in the post-serafinib setting. But now this was moved to the front line as a confirmatory um, randomized study, and it was nivolumab plus ipi compared to either serafinib or linvatinib dealer's choice. And BMS just announced on March 20th that the Nevo plus IPI arm demonstrated a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in OS with a manageable safety profile. So we do not know any other further data than that. We don't know what the numbers are, um, but we will see them at an upcoming conference. So very exciting. And then this is another study that was recently uh, presented, the phase two leopard trial. So as many of you have heard at different conferences, hepatic arterial infusion is something that um, certainly helps some of our patients with a uh, significant burden in their liver. And so this was a study that was run in Japan. It was a combination of lenvatinib uh, plus HAI with cisplatin. It was a multi-center study. And it was 36 patients, 34 of whom were valuable. And in this study, people were given up to six HAI infusions with cisplatin. Then the lenvatinib and the HAI were started on the same day. Uh, and overall, median people got four HAI infusions. The overall response rate was uh, quite decent. It was 61% in the overall population. The progression-free survival was 6.3 months, and the overall survival was 17 months. This is a single-arm study, but showing some of the benefit of combining lenvatinib and HAI. Um, 38% of people had serious adverse events. I believe it was around 17 patients out of those treated. So certainly something to think about in selecting patients and who would be well-suited for a combination like this. So what are the take-homes here? How do we select first-line therapy for advanced HCC? So I think Dervatremi and Atezobev are both very good regimens in someone who can tolerate uh, dual um, therapy up front. Um, for someone who I feel is going to be able to manage, um, someone who I think is less likely to have a major bleeding event. So someone with a grade three varices, for example, um, I would be less likely to give a Tezobev to someone with grade three varices or someone who has um, a high risk for perforation of their bowel. I'd be less likely to give a Tezobev. Um, people who had a recent GI bleed within the last six months, uh, I'd be less likely to give it. Um, if I, you know, the, this trial required an EGD within six months of giving therapy. So if I need to start therapy right away and I'm not able to get an EGD, um, that's a Dervatremi candidate. Uh, Dervatremi, I often start with Dervatremi as well. It's an excellent regimen. Um, if I feel that someone is maybe going to be less likely to be able to tolerate immune-related adverse events and maybe they don't have the social support or the family support, um, I might be less likely to use Dervatremi because we really need patients who can uh, let us know and come back if they have immune-related adverse events. And if people can't tolerate combination, then single agent is also a possibility. If they have contraindications to IO, then we think about TKIs. So case three here, David is a 66-year-old man. He has this taste uh, progression after two tases. So we talked a little bit about using frontline immunotherapy versus TKI. He doesn't have any contraindications, so I would certainly offer frontline therapy. And we talked a little bit about how we choose between these regimens. And then if the patient had child PUB disease, um, you know, right now there's a clinical trial looking at some of these uh, drugs in combination in patients with child PUB we have data for single-agent um, immune checkpoint inhibitor, and we have data for single-agent TKI as well in child PUB, but I would certainly refer to a clinical trial and see if we can see if these combo can be given safely in child PUB. Thanks, uh, Lipica. you got to love all these acronyms, right? These trials are LEOPARD and, 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 and uh, MBRAVE and STRIDE and Himalaya. Those are, good, those are good acronyms. I love those. So let's go back now to talking a little bit more about the advanced setting. And we're gonna, I'm going to go relatively fast because in the, in, the, in the spirit of time, uh, we need to go relatively fast. So, so there's an, another concept that I want to talk about is the idea of using LRT now in the advanced setting. And this is Margaret who has HBV. She has portal vein thrombosis, good liver function, and two uh, uh, lung metastases. And so is there, is there a concept here of using LRT in addition to, uh, to 
uh, to systemic therapy in the advanced settings. So let's take a look at what we have. And the first thing is, as radiologists, we have to recognize that the pattern of progression matters. An adrenal met is not the same thing as a lung met or as a local progression or as a new nodule, right? We call any progression the same thing. And so I think the pattern of progression and really understanding how patients are, are, uh, are progressing and what is the, the signature of the progression, I think, is extremely uh, important. The LAUNCH trial is a very interesting randomized trial published in JCO, 300-plus patients, really adding chemoembolization to TKI, LEN, in the advanced setting, large tumors with PVT, et cetera. And interestingly, it improved overall survival. So you have an advanced patient population improving an overall survival, and you give them LEN, plus chemoembolization from 11 to 17 months, hazard ratio 0.43. So very good finding in, in, uh, in terms of the PFS going from 6 to 10 months. So a little sort of turning, turning the whole concept on its head a little bit is as to maybe we can add LRT to patients with advanced, uh, advanced HCC. So let's start closing off here. Uh, future directions in this combination, how do we choose between uh, liver-directed therapies and systemic therapies? I think both are going to be needed in some form. You heard Lipica talk about sort of how patients are going to jump from stage to stage in multiple directions. I think burden and liver function are extremely important. And what can we benefit with this therapy at this time? What are we going to benefit? And of course, working together is important. We obviously need things like biomarkers. We, we lack of those. We certainly have AFP, but I think imaging is going to be an, imp an important one, uh, looking at how to sequence uh, therapy. Very important patient population now, the post-transplant patient population, those with uh, um, uh, child pu B. So in cl classically, all of these studies are in child pu A patients. And of course, looking at clinical scores and other metrics to see when we shift from one treatment uh, to another. So let's go back very quickly and look at, at Margaret and to see whether there's any role at this point. And so Lipica, very quickly, do you think launch uh, has made a, a difference for you or you're still thinking about looking for more evidence for combining uh, patients with LRT in the advanced setting? Yeah, I always find that lung mets overall don't get people into trouble, but liver disease does. And so in a patient like this, certainly a combination of doing liver-directed therapy plus systemic therapy would make sense. Fantastic. So let's close off and leave some time for Q&A. The HCC patient journey is dynamic and spans all specialties. Uh, I think that's becoming more and more clear. The management requires sort of a thorough understanding of all the treatments available. And again, I'm very proud that at least in the interventional radiology community, we are all being educated now on these numbers, on these clinical trials, on hazard ratios, et cetera. Combining treatment with LRTs and systemic therapies emerging for both intermediate and advanced. You heard launch and you heard about all the other studies. And I think permitting that multidisciplinary discussion optimizes patient outcomes. And I show you this slide a second time. When everybody works together, I think we're about able to get the best decision at that, for that patient for that time and optimize overall survival. So thank you, Lipica. And I think now we have some time for audience q and I don't know if there are other questions on the, uh, on the online, but we have some time now, I think about five minutes, uh, five minutes for Q&A. Anybody want to anybody venture into the Q&A realm, please? Sorry, there's a microphone. Introduce yourself, subspecialty, please. Ben Pruitt, Interventional Radiology. Uh, for patients that are already on a treatment regimen, including BEV, and you're going to do in a, uh, local regional therapy, you know, how are you coordinating that? And um, are you waiting four weeks or more, or what are you doing? That's a great question. My experience with technical adverse events and BEV really all come from the colorectal cancer patient population, those that have been on BEV for a very long time. Although I was concerned with atezo-BEV in the LRT space, what are the vessels going to look like? I have not seen that. I have not seen major adverse, ma major effect on the vessels from BEV in the HCC patients. Now, those patients have hypertrophied vessels to begin with. The parabellar plexus is large, and so there may not be that same effect. So most of my AEs are uh, in, the C in the CRC patient population. I would still probably recommend stopping a few weeks before, uh, maybe two or three weeks. Uh, but, I, there, but there are patients now that we are treating, they're on a TESO-BEV, on a TESO-BEV, and we're doing sort of consolidation treatment because there's one or two lesions that are breaking through, but tolerating everything very well. I think that's one of the nice things that we're seeing now with these combination type approaches. Other questions? Eleanor Lee here. I have two quick questions. So in launch trial, majority of patients' um, etiology of their HCC was hepatitis B, which is different from um, obviously our etiology. So what do you think about that? 
also that trial investigated the difference between sort of there's a sub analysis between C taste and dead taste. Um, they found no difference in outcome. What do you think about that? Yeah, I'll take the first question. So, you know, I am not using linvatinib standardly as my first systemic therapy. I tend to use immunotherapy combinations as my first, and I use linvatinib as sort of plan B if the patients um, can't get immunotherapy regimens. And who are the people that I'm combining IO plus LRT? It's mainly the people who I feel like are having impending doom in their liver, like people who have um, a significant amount of liver disease, like a lot of portal vein thrombosis or a very large tumor, where I feel like it would really, they would really benefit from having local control in addition to systemic therapy. Uh, that's generally the way I'm doing it. But I think we need more trials showing that combination is better. I think we all do it in practice, but I agree with you. That was Hep B and that was Lindatinib, which is a little bit different than how we practice here. The comment about the depth taste and the seed taste, I think there have been many studies now that have tried to compare depth taste and seed taste and not, they haven't been able to show that one is better than the other. Some may be close to meeting the endpoint, but none really have shown a difference. I think there may be some questions on the iPad if you want to take a look. Yeah, there was one really good question around if someone is a taste failure, would you move to Y90? If someone's a Y90 failure, would you move to taste or would you move to systemic therapy? And they asked for the example of like the patient who had two taste fail, two tastes and then progressed would you do my 90 or how do you think about that? So, so, I, so that's a great question, actually. And I think this goes back to the pattern of progression that we talked about, right? If they failed Y90 or taste and there's new nodules or vascular invasion now or metastases, that, 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 I think that answers it. I think if some of, the ex, the, some of the progression can be explained by technical issues, extrahepatic vessel, a lumbar vessel, a phrenic vessel, then I'm not sure that's, that's really a progression. It's an untreated area that we can still treat which again elevates the concepts of, of the untreatable, sorry, elevates the concept of the pattern of progression. What is the progression? And I think sometimes you can do more LRT and in more serious and sort of different types of progression, you go right to systemic therapy. There is another, is there any other question from the audience before we take one from the iPad? There's another question about adverse events with combining IO plus LRT and how do you think about that? And I'll go back to this idea that I think it would be really helpful from Emerald 1 to see the people who had three or four TASEs, the people who had VP1, VP2, the people who had um, child pu B7, what were their outcomes compared to the other group that didn't have all of those? Because I think there are patients where it's very well tolerated, and there are patients who have rapid decline in their liver function when we combine. So I think learning a little bit more from that trial and others will be really helpful. Lipica, it's always a pleasure working with you. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Please. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash FYP 860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca and ASI Incorporated. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.